All right, Carlos, are you ready to get started? Yes, I am. Okay, welcome everyone. I'm very happy to introduce our seminar speaker for today, Carlos Martinez from Columbia University. Carlos is a PhD candidate in Earth and Environmental Science, working with Drs. Lisa Goddard and Yochanan Kushner. He received his bachelor's in atmospheric science from Texas A&M University in 2015 and his master's in earth and environmental science from Columbia in 2018. During his undergraduate study, he was an NCAR source protege, so familiar to some folks in CGD, uh, and also a NOAA Holling Scholar. He has also received outstanding presentation awards from AGU and AMS. His research interests include atmosphere-ocean interactions, climate variability, and societal impacts of climate change. Today, he will speak about seasonal climatology, variability, and temporal characteristics of Caribbean rainfall. Carlos, the floor is yours. Great, thank you for that introduction. Let me uh, share my screen here. Let's see, can you see my PowerPoint? Uh, just now, yep, it's not full screen yet. There we go, great. Okay, looks good. Great. Okay. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, attending my talk today, which is on my basically my graduate work at Columbia University. And just a quick special thanks, um, as Katie mentioned, uh, to Lisa Goddard, Johanan Kushner, and Ming Fong Ting at both IRI and the uh, Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, my uh, thesis committee, as well as uh, collaboration with Angel Munez, and um, a lot. Uh, huge thanks to the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology for their help with all of this. And just a quick disclaimer, um, my camera is on my keyboard because <laughs> I bought this laptop pre-COVID thinking I wouldn't use this camera. Well, joke's on me. Um, so if I'm looking at my screen, it's not because I'm looking at a pigeon um, here in New York City. It's because that's just how the camera is placed. So with that, let's get started. So rainfall in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean region, this wonderful, amazing tropical paradise that I presume a lot of us pre-COVID would love to be at right now, given winter. Um, but in terms of atmospheric and climate dynamics, it's quite a fascinating region for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, this is a region that uh, is very highly vulnerable to changes with um, climate variability and climate change. Um, in particular, when we talk about rainfall, for example, um, it's, a, it's a region that uh, relies heavily on it for its socioeconomic well-being. Um, several industries, agriculture, health, water management, et cetera, rely on this information on rainfall, uh, seasonal outlooks, et cetera, to uh, prepare for their growing and harvesting seasons, for example. And so because of changes with rainfall, um, it's, it's very, this is a region that's very vulnerable to um, hydrometeorological disasters like droughts and floods, for example. And just from the FAO estimated um, over the past several decades, billions of dollars estimated in losses due to uh, natural disasters like weather risks and climate related events. And so because of its high reliance on rainfall, farmers, the tourism industry, they really look to their weather and climate services on forecast for rainfall. And however, the quality of that information, its efficacy is really dependent on the broader scientific understanding of the rainfall cycle. And so some catalysts here as to why I wanted to investigate this region in addition to the societal relevance. When I started my graduate studies back in 2016, the Caribbean just came out of what was a rather a potent drought, a multi-year drought over the region. Um, this is an example from Herrera and Alt of 2017 that did a PDSI uh, Palmer drought, a severity drought index across this region over the past 40 years and found that this uh, uh, meteorological drought that existed over uh, 2013 to 2015 um, was one of the worst um, across the Caribbean with um, uh, shading and brown denoting um, it being one of the worst droughts over the Caribbean. 
in addition to that, recent modeling studies have found systematic biases when characterizing the rainfall pattern and the associated dynamical mechanisms. So with those two things in mind, in addition to, um, I'm a Puerto Rican, I was born in the island, I have extended family there as well. And so there's a, there's a personal antidote there too. And so uh, that all of that combined made me really want to look at and see, well, is there a real um, comprehensive understanding over the observed rainfall cycle in the Caribbean and what gaps are there that I could uh, research and, and help uh, the community in this region given their high reliance on rainfall. And that goes into part one of this three-part presentation, the first being on the what, if you will, the seasonal climatology and the dynamic, dynamical mechanisms of rainfall in the Caribbean. This work um, is now published in Climate Dynamics. And so when I looked at the literature to look and see, well, what are the dynamical mechanisms that play a role in the Caribbean? There is a laundry list of mechanisms. And it's just because of how you know, uh, geographically unique this region is. It's sandwiched between mid-latitude and tropical forcings and with it, these small to large scale features. And previous literature has only mentioned one or a few of these dynamical mechanisms that I will explain here. The first, in terms of going from large to small scale, the first is uh, the intertropical convergence zone and the South American monsoon system. This, uh, the ITCZ bands are these elongated bands of moisture convergence that moves um, with the solar insulation cycle by a lag of one to two months. And then SAMS moves in sync with the solar insulation cycle, but its difference is that it interacts with the topography of North South America. Then you have the huge semi-permanent pressure system over the North Atlantic, also known as the North Atlantic Subtropical High, and with it these diverging um, trade winds, uh, the, the easterlies, if you will, that, that move on its southern flank and the westerlies on its northern flank, huge moisture transport for the Caribbean. Then you have some regional features, two of which are, are well known. One is the Atlantic Warm Pole, this body of warm ocean sea surface temperatures greater than 28.5 degrees centigrade that moves uh, spatially in terms of it, its extent throughout the seasons. And this zonal jet at 925 millibars of um, zonal winds known as the low level jet that also modify the extent of moisture in its exit and entrance regions. And then finally, the small puzzle pieces, if you will, of this grand uh, jigsaw puzzle, which are these easterly waves, as we know, that can develop into tropical cyclones, frontal systems, and due to the complex topography of the region, you have several localized forcings like orographic lifting, sea breezes, etc. So again, there's a lot at play here. And again, only a few uh, uh, these studies only looked at one or two of these mechanisms. In addition to that, I also found inconsistencies when papers are characterizing um, regions of um, subregions of the Caribbean rainfall cycle. This is an example from two previous papers, one from Jerry et al. of 2007, and another from Taylor and Alfaro of 2005. Here, Jerry et al., for example, in the Northwestern Caribbean, uh, determines this region to have a unimodal rainfall pattern using their monthly uh, data. But in Taylor and Alfaro, looking at different stations in that same region, they actually found a dip during the summertime and thus classified the rainfall cycle as bimodal. And so there's some inconsistencies here as to classifying um, what type of um, mo modality, if you will, of the rainfall cycle exists in different portions of the Caribbean. And that can be attributed due to the spatial and temporal scales that previous studies have utilized using monthly or seasonal means or data sets with monthly that are uh, and monthly or seasonal temporal resolutions that thus can mask the seasonal evolution of the rainfall cycle. And that can also be attributed to how this is a very data sparse region. There isn't a lot of publicly available data out there for the scientific community to utilize to investigate rainfall. So with all of that in mind, two questions came from the literature. First, what are these, you know, the small to large scale puzzle pieces, the local and remote dynamical processes that shape the overall spatial and temporal patterns of the Caribbean cycle? 
And what are then the regional differences of the seasonal cycle across the Caribbean? So how did I go about in doing this? Well, first I was super delighted to be able to collaborate with CIMH, um, the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology, where they have several station uh, rain gauges with daily data that can be utilized uh, to mitigate that issue about uh, temporal resolution. In addition to that, uh, uh, stitching with it, uh, NOAA's Global Historical Climatological Network, and then creating this metadata set with 38 stations, which you see in this photo here. In addition to that, I also am using era interim reanalysis um, for SSTs and for what I will mention in a second, the moisture budget analysis. But first, with the observations, the station data, what I did was use Pentad five-day averages of the daily rainfall observations and then calculated their annual climatological rainfall cycles. And then did a principal component analysis, which looks at different patterns associated with the uh, climatological cycle to look and see if there are any regional differences when I correlated those coefficients within each PC. And then what I did was using era and term reanalysis, I did a moisture budget analysis, which hasn't been used in the Caribbean, but is really valuable. We can um, decomposite um, the moisture budget in this, in this region to be able to better um, find and, and see how, what effect do large scale semi-permanent patterns have versus the small scale patterns. And that's what the TMF is, the total moisture flux, which is the precipitation minus evaporation, which is the integrated moisture flux over the atmospheric column with two components, the mean flow, those large scale features, and the transient flow, the smaller scale features. There's also a surface flux, which I did calculate, but I found its impact to be relatively marginal with some exceptions. That's, you know, attributed to those localized forcings, which I do state in the paper. But this, to break it down, uh, the TMF is equal to those two components. And then you can decomposite the mean flow into its mass convergence and advection of specific humidity. Alrighty. So the first is the principal component analysis, the PCA. What you see before you is the first principal component. This accounts for 54% of the variance. And this is the very classic look of the Caribbean rainfall structure that a lot of previous papers mentioned. But to break it down, there are four seasonal components. The first is the winter dry season. This is the dry time during the Caribbean, like right now, which exists anytime between late November through about March into April. Then you have this uptick in rainfall by May and June, and that's known as the early rainy season. Then you have the midsummer drought, which it's not really a drought, but they call it that in a way because it's, it's a transitional period period between the two rainfall peaks um, where you have a less wet um, or yes, less wet, wet season, <laughs> if you will. And then you have the late rainy season, which is typically known as the, uh, the prominent uh, wet season of these different seasons. And when I correlate this principal component with each of the 38 stations, what I find is besides the North South American stations, all of these stations have high positive correlations with this principal component. But when I look at the second and third PCs, this is where we see the regional differences. For example, the second principal component, which accounts for 16% of the variance, shows a modification of the early rainy season, or in, in this instance, a dip in the early rainy season. And what we see is that stations in the central and eastern Caribbean regions are positively correlated with this, signifying that they may have a weak or no early rainy season. The opposite is true for the Northwestern Caribbean and the Northern South um, American stations where we see um, this negative correlation highlighting that they have a prominent early rainy season. And then the third principal component, which accounts for 8% of the variance, shows uh, an absence of the midsummer drought, right? Because we have a dip, now we have a surplus um, and a late, late rainy season. And what we see is a latitudinal difference. We see stations in the Western Caribbean um, and the Eastern Caribbean South to be positively correlated with this, suggesting that they do not have a midsummer drought and they have a late end to their late rainy season. And then the opposite in the Northwestern Caribbean where they have a prominent midsummer drought and an early demise to their late rainy season. 
So all of that said, that gives us a nice course overview as to you know, what regional difference we're seeing here. And the moisture budget analysis tells us why. But to present this, I'll be presenting a summary schematic because this moisture budget is very detailed. And so I made these summary schematics in my paper to highlight how these dynamical mechanisms move around the Caribbean annual cycle. Um, two generalized findings, though, before I go into this, the first thing is that the mean flow component of the moisture budget was the dominating flow component. I actually found that transient flow, with some exceptions, was marginal in its influence over the climatological rainfall cycle in the Caribbean. And that mass convergence is the reason for what we see in the mean flow and thus the total moisture flux. So what you see before you is one of four panels. This is the winter dry season summary schematic with the legend off to the right here. And what you see is the following, and I'll break it down step by step. You have the North Atlantic subtropical high. Its influence is large over the Caribbean as it connects with the continental high and with it provides those easterly winds, the zonal divergence and a relatively strong low level jet. With transient divergence coming from those cold fronts that move through the region, this is why we see um, dry conditions over the region. A notable exception is over Northern South America where we have the Southern, uh, the ITZZ bands at their southernmost extent moving south and then moving again north into the springtime causing its wet season, the first of two. Then we move into the early rainy season and there's a lot of changes here. We have the North Atlantic subtropical high breaking off from the continental high and with it producing this convergence band over Central America, or Central America, Central Caribbean. However, it's interesting to note that looking at the moisture budget, this convergence band did not initialize over the Eastern Caribbean. Instead, this region is still having that influx of uh, divergence from those easterly trade winds. This is why this region does not have an early rainy season, whereas the Central Caribbean, because it's situated where uh, this convergence band is initializing, has a weak early rainy season as this feature moves into the Northwestern Caribbean and in combination with divergence weakening from the, from the cold fronts not being able to move um, as frequently into the Caribbean, this is why the Northwestern Caribbean experiences a prominent early rainy season. In addition to that, the ITZZ bands move northward now beginning the second wet season over the Guyanas. And then finally over the Western Caribbean or Central America, we see zonal convergence due to the exit region of the low level jet providing orographic lifting and the emergence of the warm pool over the Gulf of Mexico and the Western Caribbean Sea all add into convergence and thus the early rainy season over the Northwestern and Western Caribbean regions. So now we move into the midsummer drought. And what's interesting here is that we see some of these convergence features not at play now. For example, the Nash convergence band is well off to the north of the Caribbean. And with it, now you have the diverging zonal trade winds and a strong low level jet due to the southern flank of Nash, resulting in less wet conditions over most of the Caribbean. Some exception though is in the Central, Car or Central America where we see the exit region of the low level jet and the enhancement of the warm pool adding more zonal convergence, which is why the Western Caribbean experiences um, a less prominent midsummer drought. The same is true over the Eastern Caribbean where they don't have an early rainy season, but now they're receiving moisture convergence due to the uh, Atlantic ITCZ now migrating into the region. And then finally, we have the late rainy season. And this is when all the convergence features come together. You have Nash and it's a Western flank of convergence now moving back into the Caribbean. And with it, the strengthening of those transient divergent features from cold fronts, this is why the Northwestern Caribbean has its early demise of its, uh, rain, or of its late rainy season in comparison to the other regions. Meanwhile, those ITZZ bands are now at their northernmost and influencing Central, uh, the Central uh, American region and the Eastern Caribbean, which is why they have a later end to their late rainy season as those ITZZ bands slowly move southward. And you also have the largest um, spatial extent of the warm pool across the entire domain. 
And so with all of that said, um, the motion project did a really well job, nicely done uh, regarding the, um, the extent of these features moving through the Caribbean. And with that, I was able to classify five subregions over the Caribbean, the Western Caribbean, the Northwestern Caribbean, the Central Caribbean, the Central and Southern Lesser Antilles, and the Guianas in Trinidad and Tobago. So the conclusions from this section is the following. The study that I made finds that the seasonal cycle of rainfall in the Caribbean hinges on three main facilitators of moisture convergence, the two ITCC bands and the western flank of the North Atlantic subtropical high. The warm pull and the low level jet act as modifiers uh, as to the extent of moisture that is provided by these main facilitators. And the, all of their interactions, their temporal and spatial evolutions across this region is why we see these five subregions and their unique climatological annual rainfall characteristics. And finally, really important is that it was because of, uh, using more fine data like daily or penta data was critical to resolve these issues that was seen in previous studies to, um, regarding um, the seasonal evolution of the rainfall cycle, well uh, accurately characterizing it and how the mechanisms influence that. Right, so coming from that, a new set of questions came from that first paper. The first is, well, now that we know the what, um, let's talk about the how. <laughs> how do the regional dynamical processes that I found in my first paper um, change in particularly wet and dry years? And what is the resulting spatial and temporal structure of the seasonal rainfall cycle? And is there a dependency between the variability experienced in the early and late rainy seasons? Because it's very clear that each season has a different subset of dynamical mechanisms that influence it. And so does that mean that the two seasons are independent of each other, which may impart longer lead time for predictability? And that leads to my second part, which again is also published through Climate Dynamics, which is on the interannual variability of the early and late rainy seasons in this region. And so going back to the literature, what does uh, it say regarding the interannual variability? Well, I found two main culprits here, two large scale climate drivers. The first is your classic ENSO over the Pacific Basin with its teleconnection between the ocean and the atmosphere um, and how it has global teleconnections across the world, including the Atlantic Basin. And then you have the dipole SLP pattern, the North Atlantic Oscillation. Both of these have been found to influence the rainfall season across the Caribbean. However, I found some shortcomings as denoted here by this table. I found that most Caribbean wide studies only looked at ENSO or NAO. Um, so uh, one or the other, instead of looking at both. Um, studies that looked at both of these features only looked at a specific region of the Caribbean, not the entire region. And that studies that looked at both phenomena, like these four papers here, um, stop short of translating how they affect the, the dynamical processes that I found in my first paper. And then similarly to the first part, um, these studies also have used monthly or seasonal averages or using data um, that are in that temporal scale or the analyses in those temporal scales that can thus mask the seasonal evolutions of these rainfall seasons. And so going back, um, using my 34 stations with all of that in mind, I did the following. Um, for this part, I used four regions. I did not use the Guiana stations because I found that the Guianas uh, actually has a lag in their rainfall cycle. Um, and so I am using the Trinidad and Tobago stations and the rest of the four regions across the Caribbean for this part. Um, and what I did was I, used, I calculated several composites taking SST data, sea level pressure, the mean flow component of the moisture budget given its significance, and then some indices related to these two climate drivers. And what I did was I calculated again pentad five day averages of these stations rainfall. And now I did uh, what, what I did was I ranked the driest and wettest early and late rainy seasons across each of these stations and then created a Caribbean averaged. Um, subset of early or of, of driest and wettest early and late rainy seasons to create these composites utilizing these variables that are associated to influence rainfall. 
and then did a two-sided t-test for significance and I compared dry minus wet early rainy season years and dry minus wet late rainy season years. All right, so the first part is on the early rainy season and its relationship with ENSO and the North Atlantic Oscillation, NAO. So what you see before you is a composite uh, of dry minus wet early rainy season years, so the subset of those two, um, uh, dry minus wet, uh, for sea surface temperatures and for sea level pressure during the winter dry season of dry minus wet early rainy season years. Uh, and what you find is very interesting. Shading uh, denotes significance. And what you find is a classic NAO signal during the winter time. You see the tripole SST signal, blue denoting um, cooler ocean temperatures, uh, red denoting warm ocean temperatures, which you see um, over the Northwestern Caribbean, and then this really large cold signal over the tropical um, North Atlantic. Over into the SLP, we see the classic dipole signature with um, anomalous high pressure and anomalous low pressure over the North Atlantic. In the meantime, or meanwhile, in the Eastern Pacific, you don't see um, a, a strong of a signal, anomalous signal. When we move into the early rainy season, in this case, the month of May, what we see is a persistence of these anomalous signals. We see a persistence, especially with the cold SST signal over um, the Caribbean and, and, and the tropical um, North Atlantic, and likewise for the um, high pressure anomalies. And what this suggests is ocean memory and what's called the wind evaporation SST feedback. So for example, you have this coupled SST gradient and under a dry condition you produce, or dry or wet condition, you produce an SLP gradient. Um, but under dry conditions, this enhances the easterly winds over the cold SST signal, which um, allows for more heat flux out of the ocean and into the atmosphere, which is why you see the persistence of cold SSTs um, over most of the Caribbean. And as you see in the month of June, we see that cold signal continuing, most likely due to this west feedback. And so with all of that in mind, um, I went and looked at the climate drivers um, indices and I correlated it with Caribbean wide early rainy season anomalies. So in blue, you have the NAO correlations with um, ERS anomalies and in orange is for ENSO. And what I find is that wintertime NAO indices are negatively correlated with the Caribbean wide early rainy season anomalies. Uh, you see the opposite for ENSO, but um, you don't see the significance or the signal as robust as you would for the NAO, which is very telling. So how does this then translate with the moisture budget? So this is looking at a composite of the mean flow fluxes and convergence, brown denoting divergence, green denoting convergence. And what you see is um, a lot of brown, a lot of divergence during dry years. Um, and with it, the moisture flux anomalies are suggesting um, an end result of, of, of stronger easterlies over most of the Caribbean. And in addition to these couplets that we see here over the Eastern Pacific and Atlantic basins, denoting a Southern displacement of the ITCC bands continuing into June. There is a notable signature though, over the Northwestern Caribbean, which is this convergence feature. And what this is suggesting is that Nash, the North Atlantic subtropical high under dry years, because you have a positive winter induced NAO, you have a stronger Nash and with it, the Western flank of that convergence band that I presented in part one under dry years is actually shifted westward. It initializes further westward, causing actually anomalous convergence over the Northwestern Caribbean with the influx of um, southeasterlies, anomalous southeasterlies over the corridor. And this is why the Northwestern Caribbean is very unique in that for some of the early rainy season, it's anomalies are muted in terms of, uh, or in relationship with some of the other regions. It does not have a strong of a dry signal during dry early rainy season years in comparison to the other regions and likewise during wet years. All right, so now the late rainy season and its relationship with ENSO and the North Atlantic Oscillation. What you see here is very similar, but for the, for the September month, 
um, associated with dry minus wet late rainy season years. And what we see is a very different picture. We see in the Eastern Pacific Basin, we have warm SSTs and lower pressure over the Eastern Pacific. And in the Atlantic, the tropical Atlantic, we see cold SSTs and um, high anomalous pressure over the Caribbean um, and tropical Atlantic. And this is classic atmospheric bridge effect where you have the warm ENSO event, in this case for dry years, that causes a moisture, excuse me, being fluxed out of the Atlantic Basin and onto the, the Eastern and Central Pacific Basins. And this continues on into, for the most part, October. And then interestingly, in November, we see some changes here as the as as ENSO matures um, by the winter time we see this anomalous SLP signal over the North Atlantic with uh, what appears to be a couple pattern of um, anomalous low pressure over the northwestern Caribbean and some anomalous warm SSTs and I will get into that um, in the mean flow um, anomalies in a second. But first, going back to the climate drivers, I did the same thing as I did for the early rainy season. I took um, the ENSO and NAO um, indices and I correlated it with Caribbean wide late rainy season anomalies. And what you see is that summer into the winter time ENSOs are significantly and negatively correlated with Caribbean wide late rainy season anomalies. And when I, when I, um, correlated the early and late rainy season anomalies together, I found that they are uncorrelated, which suggests that the variability of the early and late rainy seasons are independent of each other. And this is because you have two um, largely independent climate drivers impacting two different seasonal components of the rainfall cycle in the Caribbean. Alrighty, so now going back to the mean flow composites for late rainy season years, what I find is what I was saying earlier about the atmospheric bridge effect and thus at the surface you have an uh, a flux um, from the Atlantic onto the Caribbean with these the intensification of the zonal easterly winds, which is why you see a strengthening of the Eastern Pacific um, ITCC, but it's it's south of the region than it, what, what it normally would be during this time of year, and a weakening of the Atlantic ITCC's influence over the Eastern Caribbean. Interestingly, though, in November, with that anomalous high signal that I saw in the SLP composites and warm SST signal, um, you see convergence again over the northwestern Caribbean with um, uh, uh, southeasterly anomalous winds, which suggests that the late rainy season in the northwestern Caribbean does not end um, as quickly as it would uh, during dry years, which is why, again, I find even in the late rainy season, the Northwestern Caribbean has its precipitation anomalies to be muted or to not have, for example, during dry years, a dry of a signal in comparison to the rest of the Caribbean. So in conclusion here, the NAO for the early, early rainy season interannual variability is the cl dominating cr climate driver um, for the Caribbean. It's dominated due to a persistent anomalous SST pattern that's associated with uh, the preceding winter NAO. So it, the NAO induces that signal during the winter time, causing this west feedback mechanism over the region. And, for, and, and during a positive state, this results in dryness over most of the Caribbean, with some exception across the northwestern corridor due to the western shift of the Nash convergence band. And then for the late rainy season, we see ENSO as the dominating climate driver associated with the SLP seesaw pattern between the Eastern Pacific and tropical North Atlantic basins. And that during a warm ENSO state, we see dryness over all of the Caribbean with some notable exception during the end of the late rainy season, moving into the winter dry season across the Northwestern Caribbean, causing no change or actually wetter conditions. And that the difference between these two climate drivers affecting each component is why we see the variability of both rainfall components to be independent of one another. Alrighty, so this leads to the last part of this presentation, which is on the temporal characteristics of the Caribbean rainfall cycle. So I'm kind of deviating away from parts one and two, but the reason why um, I will explain in a second, but also it's because um, 
these two parts give us now a wonderful observational framework as to how and what the mechanisms and the rainfall cycle works across the Caribbean. But specifically, why am I looking at temporal characteristics? Well, these uh, are considered subseasonal to seasonal rainfall characteristics, like the onset, duration, demise. This is very significant for numerous industries in the Caribbean. For example, agriculture, they actually consider uh, temporal characteristics to be more useful um, than rainfall amount as they're planning when does the wet season start and when does the wet season end. So for their growing and harvesting seasons for planting and food production, water consumption, health, um, as well related to waterborne diseases too. However, when looking at previous studies, I found that uh, most studies have not yet looked or calculated temporal characteristics in this region. And just highlighting uh, uh, recent studies, and this is to, to also highlight that, you know, uh, rainfall characteristics have not been necessarily calculated over this region until recently. And of those that have calculated those, it's been primarily precipitation amount or the frequency of wet versus dry days, et cetera. So with that, I wanted to then look at previous methods that calculate onset and demise across anywhere around the world and just utilize that for the Caribbean. Easy as that, right? Well, I found some major roadblocks from utilizing onset and demise methods from previous studies. And the reason is because of the complexity of this region with its rainfall regime or rainfall cycle. Some shortcomings I found from previous studies when trying to calculate onset and demise in this region are the following. Most studies only consider unimodal rainfall patterns when focusing on their specific region that have distinct wet and dry seasons or that studies use a climatological annual mean to calculate where the onset and demise is, which can skew the location of the onset and demise for multimodal rainfall patterns. So for example, as described in the previous part, we know that the early and late rainy seasons are independent of each other. So their characteristics and the variability of their characteristics are gonna be very different from one another. And if you use a climatological annual mean, you're going to cause biases associated with the overall rainfall pattern in the region because of that independency. Then of course there's differences in uh, determining what is an onset or demise based off of agronomical and meteorological considerations. Um, several studies use meteorological considerations denoting monsoonal patterns or more dynamical studies, but agronomically, um, people, farmers, for example, just want to know when the rainfall season is meaning of the certain threshold of their given crop. Um, so all of that in mind, an example here is from Bombardi at All 2020, we did a review paper um, over uh, different onset and demise methods. And it was clear that um, using Morin and Robertson's 2014 calculation of onset and demise is using their method. Shading here denotes a second onset, denoting a second rainfall season. And you see clearly that you don't see that across the Caribbean. You see a lot of white space here, uh, but it's clear that there is the late rainy season. So that's just an example highlighting some of those inconsistencies. And so if I can't find a method that fits for my region, I have to make one. <laughs> and that's what I did. I created a new and comprehensive method that aims to do the following. First, include both agronomical and meteorological considerations to give flexibility for the user when inputting their values related to what it is that they're um, calculating. And three, frame the characteristics based off of the modality of the annual cycle, whether it's unimodal, trimodal, bimodal, et cetera. And then what I did here is then I investigated the relationship between these temporal, temporal characteristics and rainfall amount between these seasons. But for this presentation, I'm only highlighting um, the meteorological consideration. The agronomical considerations is in the paper that's under review, but uh, due to the balance of time and also um, what I'm now working on to complete my PhD, I'm looking at um, these characteristics through a meteorological lens. And so what I will be showing is a step-by-step -step overview as to how this method works using an example um, from the Northwestern Caribbean, averaging stations, uh, the stations associated with this region into a regional um, 
average of its uh, climatological rainfall cycle, which uh, you see here. Day one denotes March 1st. I shifted the calendar uh, to focus in on the wet season. And what you see is the very classic bimodal structure with the early and late rainy seasons. So I use daily data, which I think is very valuable to utilize. And I used a harmonics filter to produce the uh, climatology, which does a well job representing the overall North Caribbean annual climatological cycle. And then what I do is I put a start and end dates for the analysis. And this is used to determine the initial onset and the final demise of the climatological rainfall season, given the, you know, the squiggles or the variabilities that you see in the year to year. And this can be determined numerically or by tradition. And for the Northwestern Caribbean, I did it by tradition where the start date is April 1st, as denoted by CIMH, and the end is November 30th. And so once you have start and end dates set, then I calculate the, intermi the intermittent dry periods between the start and end date. And this is very important for what I will explain in a, in a minute, but to calculate this, um, this is the difference between the peak that's associated with uh, a given rainfall season and its trough. And if the peak to trough has a difference above 0.5 millimeters, which is what I deemed for the Northwestern Caribbean, or one can use one millimeter, that's a very common uh, threshold to use. Um, I consider this period an intermittent dry period. Um, and this is to uh, better calculate and characterize intermittent dry periods, because as you see here, this is not necessarily a dry period, but it's really a transition between two rainfall um, seasons because of their independence, right, which is suggestive of that. But you can also utilize this characteristic characterization if, for example, you have an intermittent dry period that was more of what you would normally see as a, like a, a legitimate dry season. So the reason why I'm calculating intermittent dry periods is that it allows me to then put seasonal windows over the annual cycle. So how many intermittent dry periods I have determine how many seasonal windows there are. And so for this example in the Northwestern Caribbean, I have two seasonal windows because I have one intermittent dry period. One is the green box, which is the first seasonal window or the early rainy season, which is from the start date to the location of the minimum of the intermittent dry period. And then the late rainy season in yellow, which is from that same date to the end date. And then you have a separate window to calculate characteristics of the intermittent dry period. And so now that I have the seasonal window set, then I look at the year-to-year -year data, um, smoothing the data using a Gaussian smoothing filter, and I look at every trough to peak for, for onsets and utilize two criteria to determine if this day is considered a candidate for the onset. Those two criteria is a millimeter threshold. In this example, I have one millimeter and a rate of change threshold because for onsets, um, intensity of rainfall is typically associated with the onset of rainfall. And so um, here, for example, how I calculate that is that I look at the climatology and I look at where the onset would normally be and calculate its peak and trough and the days in between to then calculate what is the uh, millimeter per day average. And then I look at whether a day meets that criteria over a 10 day period. So that day and then thereafter to see if we're seeing that rate of change. And if those two criteria are met, then you get a candidate onset. So I have several of these circles denoting candidate onsets. And then I have the same for the demise, but I don't have a rate of change threshold because the demise is just when you finally hit the dry season when um, the demise is below the millimeter threshold. And so what I do um, before utilizing those candidate onsets and demises is I calculate the accumulated precipitation anomalies from mean at a given day. And that is the summation between the, date of the, the start date of the calculation um, to day n. And it's a summation between that day's value of precipitation minus P window, which in this case is different from previous studies. Previous studies use a calendar annual mean, but in this study, I used a seasonal window mean that's relative to each year. 
And this is to then take out the magnitude of the rainfall cycle, such that, for example, if you have a very dry year, but you still have a wet signal that looks um, or is characterized as an onset, um, if you use a climatological annual mean, you may miss that onset. And so to, to mitigate that, I use this relative um, to each year's mean for every year. So I have like 38 of these values representing each year to calculate this. And so those are the two big differences, using a seasonal window um, to calculate this and using this uh, P window differently than previous studies. And so to show an example of this, the Northwestern Caribbean, because I have two windows, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna calculate this twice, one for the early rainy season, which starts at or shortly before the date uh, of the start date. And um, I'm going to look for the minimum of this value of this, um, of, of the accumulated precipitation anomalies because that's where we see the switch um, indicating the onset. And then for the late rainy season, because it's totally different, I have it starting where the, the start date locating of the start date, which is where the late rainy season window starts. And I look at the maximum, which is where we see that switch to then um, find where the demise is. And these stars are benchmarks right? So that so they're telling me where the switch is happening. And then what I do is then I look at which candidate onset or demise is, is referencing that benchmark star. And um, I do this by, by looking uh, at percentiles associated with it in case there are several kinks leading up to um, the star or after. And from there, I then pinpoint, okay, this is where the onset is or the demise is as um, this benchmark is being now uh, met to then accurately find where the onset and demise is located. So what I did here just to finish up is that I did this, you know, for the 38 different years. So I have 38 onsets and 38 demises for um, each region. And I did an average of them for each region. And so this, these first two columns are showcasing the mean onset and demise dates for each of the regions. Um, the standard deviation is highlighted in parentheses. And what I found is that my method resembles very well um, my previous work on the start and end of the rainfall cycle. And when I, comp when I replicated other methods and how they calculated it for the Caribbean, I found either later or later onsets or earlier demises. And this can be attributed to three things. First, again, as I highlighted previously, using P-Window as the annual climatological daily mean, also previous methods solely determine onset and demises by the star. And as you can as you can see, that's not clearly where the onset and demise is. It's just when the threshold's being met. And then finally, not using seasonal windows, which more accurately pinpoint um, the location of these onset and demise dates. And then what I did was I looked at the variability of the onset and demise to then correlate with rainfall amounts. So what you see here is the correlations with early rainy season Caribbean wide totals and my method and uh, an adaptation of my method and previous methods. And the likewise for late rainy season totals and for the demise. Bold signif shows significance. And what I find is that my uh, method um, shows a small, or no correlation between onset and demise and uh, seasonal rainfall totals. But when I change P window in my method to a climatological seasonal window mean, I find high and significant correlations. And likewise for previous studies too, which use a climatological annual mean. And this is, this is really interesting. This suggests that methods that use a climatological mean as P window to calculate onset and demises have higher correlations with seasonal rainfall totals. And this is because one is building in that relationship between rainfall amount and the timing of the annual cycle uh, in the methodology by investigating anomalous precipitation respective to the mean normal. So the year-to-year -year variability of climatologically based onsets and demises resemble the variability of the seasonal rainfall totals in the region.
So in conclusion with this final piece, the method that I created because of some of the inconsistencies that I found in previous ways to calculate onset and demise characterizes the seasonal evolution of mean onsets and demises well when comparing it to my previous work. And that onsets and demises that, are, that have a P window that is based on the climatology are correlated with seasonal rainfall totals for both seasons. But this is not the case when it's when P window is relative to each uh, year's means. And this suggests that the seasonal rainfall amounts thus are influenced by changes perhaps in the magnitude of the rainfall season rather than changes in its timing. And so finally, where do I go from here? Parts one and two, we, we were able to clearly uh, delineate what mechanisms or puzzle pieces shape the annual cycle and its variability. Part three developed a methodology that characterizes well uh, these, these well these really important and needed characteristics for the Caribbean. This sets us up nicely to part four, which is what I'm working on now to complete my dissertation, which is on the predictability of the rainfall cycle. And this does two things. One is looked at the observed variables um, that I found found that are likely to influence rainfall and see what skill they have in predicting these well needed and, and important rainfall characteristics. And then I'm going to shift into modeling by looking at one of the observed variables that show skill, how do they have skill in operational models that exist today on predicting these characteristics. And so one quick example for that is that I took um, sea level pressure over the North Atlantic. I did a spatial map and did a canonical correlation analysis using IRI's climate predictability tool. And I found that sea level pressure in May has skill in predicting onset dates in the Eastern Caribbean, which are typically in June. And so knowing that I looked at the North American multi-member ensemble model, a predictive model using several members and basically uh, did a, a cross validation of the, what they believe are the onset dates based off of using sea level pressure in May. And what I found is that their Spearman correlations with the observations highlighted in brown show um, moderate to high correlations, which suggests that the model then one could utilize sea level pressure over the North Atlantic as a way to forecast onset dates um, for June. And what I hope to do then from that is go more into modeling by looking at uh, the simulation of other models like CSM, uh, the large ensemble version two um, or CMIP six, um, look at uh, the forcings like greenhouse gas forcings or aerosol forcings as well when looking at future climate as well. Now that I have this amazing, this really nice observational framework that understands rainfall in the Caribbean. So I'll leave this slide here, which has the summary and conclusions, and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carlos, for that great talk, really digging into the mechanisms of this complex region. Um, so there's a couple of ways you can ask questions. You can uh, use the raise your hand button, which is located under the reactions pane at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And then you can unmute yourself and ask your question or you can type any questions you have into the chat box and I'll read them out loud. I guess I had a question to start us off. You know, you kind of mentioned this at the end about considering future climate changes. Do you have any thoughts on how climate change might impact some of these large scale mechanisms or are we already seeing some of that in the Caribbean? Yeah, so in terms of detection and attribution, it's really interesting. This region from previous work has found um, either no trend or there's a there's a drying trend, but they use the annual um, precipitation um, to calculate those trends. And what's interesting from my work is that it's very clear that the seasons of the rainfall, um, rainfall components in the Caribbean are different. The early rainy and late rainy seasons have two different set of dynamics that are controlled or influenced by two different climate drivers. So one thing I was hoping to do for future climate is to investigate what the future climate is for the early rainy season and the late rainy season. And that perhaps you're having two different seasons, um, having two different changes that then result in an annual mean that's muted um, to explain what some of these previous studies have investigated. I'm really interested also in what the general circulation will look like with a lot of these different mechanisms and how the moisture budget will change and um, 
and and thus consequently how will that impact uh, farmers and a lot of these other industries that rely on rainfall given um, their uh, given the socioeconomic need of that in the region thanks other questions You know, while we're waiting for other questions, since you mentioned agriculture, I was also wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of those constraints on your methodology. I know you, you said you were only going to focus on the meteorological ones for this talk. Right, uh, because my, my work now is looking at uh, more more dynamic, so I'm looking at the meteorological onset and endemizes, but uh, what I presented in this paper that's under review is that um, you can input the, the um, values or thresholds like soil moisture content, um, evapotranspiration, et cetera, on the candidate onset and demises um, to, then see, to then investigate and see whether or not you have an ag agronomical onset and demise. Because sometimes you, you can have, for example, transient activity that um, is not you know, the wet season, but it could preclude the wet season and that would be sufficient for a given crop. Um, and, so, and that's valuable to include um, under an agronomical context. So I describe that and, and differentiate meteorological and agronomical onsets and demises uh, by highlighting how um, you have these differences and what users tend to look for mm -hmm. and uh, the value of a method like this that one can um, input their thresholds or values that are related to their need um, under a method that's relatively similar by that meaning these candidate onsets and demise dates um, is, is, is valuable, is valuable. Great, I see Joni has a question, go ahead. Hi, that was a great talk. I really enjoyed it, Carlos. Um, Thank you. Question I have, uh, because you're doing this so much for uh, the socioeconomic needs and the people that are involved in agriculture and so forth is, are you working with them directly to find out how they can interpret your results and your data and how they can use them with all of the uncertainties and everything else involved? I mean, I, do you have a, a plan for doing that? I hope I didn't miss that in your talk. No, yeah, it's a great question. So I've been in um, uh, collaboration and coordination with CIMH, with the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology. Um, I've been uh, just in discussion with them on, um, for example, this methodology paper that I that I that's under review. Um, and, and when I started this um, endeavor on investigating rainfall, I really, you know, first talked to the folks down there and see what were they looking for? What needs do they desire to know or understand related to rainfall? And, and what I came across was just, there really isn't a full comprehensive understanding um, of the rainfall pattern in the Caribbean. And also how sometimes previous methods consider the Caribbean as one homogenous region, uh, but there are very distinct differences between, for example, the Lesser Antilles and the Northwestern Corridor. And so working with CIMH to discuss those differences and then apply that for their given regions um, is, is, was, was a huge catalyst as to why I, I looked at this through a region by region lens. Uh, that then can be uh, of more value and use for uh, people who live in these different areas. And what I hope to do in my postdoc um, is to continue that collaboration with them on the modeling framework um, to see what crops are going to you know, be impacted by future climate related to these different characteristics and changes in the mechanisms. Okay, thanks. Great. We have a couple of questions in the chat. A question from Eric. Did you explore the physical mechanisms that could explain the MSD, but in the Caribbean basin, not in the Eastern Tropical Pacific? Yes. So um, as, as I showed in the first part, the 
you know, the, the midsummer drought is in a way an absence of some of these mechanisms that are in the Caribbean, right? So we have the Western flank of uh, Nash convergence away from the Caribbean and with it, you have the influx of those easterly trade winds across the Caribbean uh, region thus resulting in a midsummer drought. So it's like you're, you're, you're taking the convergence out and you're replacing it with divergence, um, resulting in um, the midsummer drought, despite these other regional modifiers like the Atlantic warm pool expanding in the exit region of the low level jet. Um, I didn't mention in part three that I did characterize the midsummer drought um, using the intermittent dry period seasonal window. And I did investigate um, different characteristics. Um, it's difficult to calculate onset and demise uh, for the midsummer drought, given that it's a less wet um, rainfall season, you don't have a clear dry signal. Um, and so instead what I did was, which can be useful for other regions is look at the magnitude of the midsummer drought, look at its duration, how many days did I find that I quantified as a midsummer drought day. Um, and I found several relationships between the onset or demise associated with the wet seasons and uh, the magnitude and the duration of the midsummer drought. And I'm really interested in looking more into that. Uh, yeah. Great. So I think we'll just take this last question from Laura in the chat. She says, really nice presentation. Do you think your work may be able to help with predicting seasonal rainfall in the region? Uh, in the Caribbean or other regions? Is that the question? Uh, I assume the Caribbean, but um, Laura, feel free to unmute and clarify. Uh, yes, I meant in, in the Caribbean and in, in different regions in the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And that's what I'm looking at now. Um, I'm looking at these operational models, the NMME, looking at these different characteristics um, and see if there's skill because uh, some you know, seasonal outlooks look to only sea surface temperature, for example, SST anomalies to then determine if there's gonna be an above or below normal year. Um, also, the independency of the early and late rainy season gives credence to not investigate a seasonal outlook for all the seasons at once, um, given the different subset of dynamics that play a role in each season. Um, and so I'm looking now into that um, and, and hope that, what I do find, which I am seeing some initial results of that there is skill in the models on different other variables like sea level pressure, zonal winds, um, moisture fluxes that then could be utilized in an operational context uh, to better um, investigate and pinpoint um, what uh, the seasonal rainfall totals will look like across different regions of the Caribbean. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, so I think we'll end there for now. Next week, we'll hear from uh, Scott Bachman and Gustavo Marquez, both of uh, CGD. So thanks again, Carlos, for a great talk.